and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. Perspective and news progressives can use. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It's November 15th, 2019, and today we're going to be discussing a Bolivia brief, Bernie's immigration plan, and the latest technology news. So I'll, I want to begin with Bolivia, and I, and I want to start by saying that I, I really didn't know much about Bolivia's situation before this week. When I heard there was a coup, I wanted to learn as much as possible because I, I could see that my network of progressive activists and friends were really upset about what was going on. Now normally, I wouldn't want to dive into something that I don't have a real subject matter expertise on. Certain subjects I feel like I've been researching for years. Um, but I think it's important enough for everyone to understand what's happening, so I wanted to share the research I have done and the discussions I have had over the past week. So you've probably heard by now that there was a coup uh, happening in Bolivia where the military is supporting a far right-wing faction that has essentially ousted the president. Evo Morales has been the president of Bolivia since January of 2006. He was the first indigenous president to be elected in Bolivia. He's a socialist and under his rule, the country's done really well. Uh, during his presidency, Morales increased taxation on the hydrocarbon industry to bolster social spending, essentially leading towards a mixed economy, uh, more public investments. He emphasized projects to combat illiteracy, poverty, racism, and, and sexism. One of his more controversial decisions on the international stage was uh, Morales focused on reducing Bolivia's dependence on the World Bank and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. His administration oversaw strong economic growth uh, while following a policy termed quote-unquote Evonomics, which essentially sought to move from a liberal economic approach to a more mixed economy. Um, a mixed economy is something I've, I've spoken about in the past. Uh, essentially a, a democratic process of socialization. So you can have, instead of having a singular market like we exist in right now, um, all of capitalism falls into a certain regime of capitalism of, of one market, we can have multiple markets. So you would say, for example, that something like energy might be a socialized market, but video games may stay a capitalistic market. Um, the idea is that you don't need to have a full-scale uh, wholesale revolution of a switch of economies um, because A, you know, that would also be you know, oppressive in a different direction to some people, and B, it's, it's not as likely as the mixed economy approach to actually manifest. Um, so he was really experimenting with that. He scaled back U.S. influence in the country and, and focused on building uh, influence with leftist governments in Latin America. Winning a recall referendum in 2008, he instituted a new constitution that established Bolivia as a plurinational state and was re-elected in 2009. Um, a plurinational state, I just want to you know, break that open for a moment, is a state that's defined by the coexistence of two or more sealed or preserved national groups. So in uh, Bolivia's case, it was the indigenous people and the non-indigenous people. Now, a second term witnessed the continuation of leftist policies in Bolivia's joining of the Bank of the South and Community of Latin American Caribbean States. Uh, and then he was again re-elected in 2014, and then again in the 2019 general elections. There's a really excellent report I'm going to share in the description that I read from the Center of Economic Policy and Research that details Bolivia's economic progress. Essentially, Bolivia had a, a functioning democracy that was doing very well. Unemployment was down, wages had increased, poverty had decreased significantly. But here's where things kind of get a little confusing. So I mentioned just a moment ago that Morales was elected in 2019, but there's criticism saying that he should not have been on the ballot at all in 2019 because he lost a February 2016 referendum on indefinite presidential reelections, essentially removing term limits, um, which a slight majority, I believe it was a little bit over 51%, rejected. So the majority of the country rejected that this, um, you know, no term limits. But Morales overcame the hurdle when Bolivia's electoral court declared in 2017 that not allowing Morales to run for indefinite re-election violated his uh, human rights. Now, many Bolivians disagreed with the controversial decision, including some who had previously supported Morales. Now, my initial reaction before doing the research was to be really critical of that, that aspect I just mentioned, specifically extending term limits um, or eliminating them while in elected office strikes me as foul. Um, 
But for the 49% of Bolivians that voted for it, I imagine you know that wasn't really the case. But with, with that said too, Bolivia is a democracy. So we don't have to look too far you know, into our past here in the United States to recognize that there have been many court decisions that people were very unhappy about. Um, we remember when the US courts ruled in favor of George Bush over Al Gore for the state of Florida election, a decision that literally cost Al Gore the presidency. Now, this is traditionally held firm in the United States, but perhaps it may not be so in the future given the now politicized courts. But again, if, if you call the court decision illegitimate in, in Bolivia, but if you're going to argue, for example, that the Bolivian court decision was illegitimate, it requires you to defend that argument with answering how any court decision in any country can be legitimate because you can't just pick and choose what is and is not legitimate. The courts decided this was so that he could run again, therefore it was legal. And much of the claims of illegitimacy actually stem from a group called the Organization of American States, or the OAS for short. In an October 21st press release, the OAS falsely claimed that Bolivian electoral authorities in the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, the TSC, and I quote, presented data with an inexplicable change in trend that drastically modifies the fate of the election and generates a loss of confidence in the electoral process. They're essentially arguing about voting results prior to a full count. I think that's really important. This press release focuses specifically on a section of the electoral results, um, but given Morales' support from Bolivia's more rural indigenous regions, it wasn't surprising. Um, no one was surprised that this was the case. So essentially the OAS is saying, hey, look at these numbers. These don't add up. But anyone familiar with Bolivian politics understands that the rural, more indigenous regions, those votes take longer to count. I'm not alone in my condemnation of this report. An economist named Mark Weserbrot from the Center of Economic Policy and Research explained, there is nothing inexplicable going on. And I quote, this kind of change in voting results due to later reporting areas being politically or demographically different than earlier ones is quite common in election returns. As anyone who's watched an election returns come in on CNN in the United States knows, that's why it's wrong to draw conclusions from a change in the voting pattern without any statistical analysis or even closely looking at the data. When Morales was accused of fraud, he encouraged a second vote. He said, you know what? If you believe there was fraud, then let's do it again, because he knew he would win a decisive victory, as he did in this 2019 election. Now, a coup, you hear that word, and, and there may be some confusion over the word. Is this a coup or not? The answer is yes. A coup is defined as a sudden, violent, or illegal seizure of government. And that's exactly what's happening in Bolivia. We can't really sugarcoat it. The use of the military to intervene in the process is what makes this entire event disturbing and important for you and I to really understand, even here in the United States. What the right-wing party did by engaging the military is completely undemocratic and provides us a glimpse of what their intentions are. It's not about the people of Bolivia, it's about power through coercion. Now we haven't even talked about the lithium. Lithium is used to develop energy storage batteries, like for example, in electric cars or solar energy storage. I spent a lot of this past week reading about Bolivia's lithium deposits, um, but as with most news today, there are counter arguments making the truth slippery to grasp. So I'm gonna to present to you what I learned and kind of give you my analysis. Um, here's what we know. Bolivia has what is estimated to be the largest supply of lithium resources in the world. Now I use that language intentionally. These aren't reserves, meaning that the minerals aren't ready to be sold and transformed into production materials. So when you say resources, it just means the lithium is in the earth. They haven't been drawn out at this moment. Many people believe that Morales' goal was to socialize the lithium and ensure that the people receive the benefits instead of just, for example, selling it off to private companies. One theory is that the ouster of Evo Morales was exactly for this reason. It's an idea based on a long tradition of United States foreign policy designed to control natural wealth by any means necessary. Now, this idea isn't a conspiracy theory. It's actually rooted in American history. Um, for example, in the past, the U.S. deployed Marines in defense of the United Fruit Company's interests in Central America. 
Um, or, you know, we can look at more recently President Donald Trump's repeated orders to, tr to have troops go protect the oil in Syria instead of, for example, our Kurdish allies. Now, Bolivia also had a $3 billion contract with China for its lithium. So is this, you know, to, not to get too conspiracy-esque, but is this the front of a new you know, lithium proxy fight? Is this a, a dawn of a new lithium war um, happening in just a different format? And I know that might sound a little conspiracy theory-esque, but you know, let's just look at the, the, the facts, right? If we look at, for example, um, Tesla stock, Tesla makes uh, energy storage batteries, electric vehicles, all of which need you know, copious amounts of lithium. Um, the stock raised up, I think, I believe $100 a share. It almost added like a 33% uh, to its value in the last month uh, once the Bolivia situation went down. So something to think about. It's, I think it's difficult to deny that there is likely some sort of corporate influence uh, or private influence involved in this coup. Um, and it's really, really sad. It's really sad that the Bolivian people um, you know, were, were doing very well under this socialist government. Uh, and this coup seems to be a coup for resources. And the replacement it happens to be, I think, very ultra right wing. You know, Bolivia's situation is really reminiscent of the struggle of democracies throughout the world. Uh, here in the United States, we have Donald Trump. Uh, Brazil has Bolsonaro. The United Kingdom has Brexit and Boris Johnson, who, by the way, is now accepting Russian money for his campaign. Um, so it's, it's a really disturbing trend brought on by two major factors. The first is the global concentration of wealth. Now, wealth concentration has always been bad throughout history, but today it is so radically bad. And more importantly, we all know about it. It's not a secret anymore. And that's just it. 500 years ago, the average peasant had no idea just how much more wealth the king had than they did. And even if they did, they were in many respects powerless to stop it. We are not powerless. And although not every strike against democracy is directly attributed to wealth, it is almost always behind the scenes pulling the strings in some fashion uh, or another. Billionaire interests need to be quashed. No person deserves that much power in a global society like the one we are transforming into. The second factor, which is talked about less than the first, is a problem of having a major generational divide in terms of technology and consciousness. So we've had instant communication come into this world in, in relatively a blink of an eye, and our collective population was not ready. When I ran for state assembly in, in early 2019, I used to joke a lot about with our constituents that I was a child of the internet, um, but it wasn't really a joke, right? I, I've had uh, the dial-up internet since I was 11 years old, and it, it isn't really a surprise that there are major value conflicts uh, between people who've grown up with high-speed internet access, or in my case, slow speed, right, until college when it got high speed, um, and those who, ha who don't. Almost half the people alive today grew up making friends beyond these artificial and inherited barriers of race, class, religion. Um, you know, and we did it through games, through forums, and other modes of communication, chat rooms. The other half is very confused. Confused about why our values are so different, about why we are, quote-unquote, complaining so much, about why we don't pull ourselves up from our bootstraps, as if the majority of us had bootstraps to pull ourselves up from. I believe a globally integrated and cooperative world is already here, but it's in its infancy, and we have to nurture and support it. These democratic setbacks are, are really unfortunate, but they're certainly not a determining factor of the future. Only the present has a say in what lies ahead tomorrow. I want to move on to, uh, to Bernie Sanders and his recently released plan detailing immigration reform. Uh, and I want to take some time to dive into it. I'm going to kind of take a, an approach to this proposal from three different aspects. I'm going to explore the descriptive, meaning I'm going to explore you know, what he's talking about, what's on the plan. I'm going to discuss how progressives might frame these issues to people who may not share our perspectives on the world. And then finally, I'll offer perspective on a larger picture relation um, to immigration here in the United States. Bernie's plan approaches immigration from a very different perspective than the current administration. 
but admits that he will likely need to use his executive authority to enact some of the resolutions if Congress is unwilling to cooperate. So right away, we have to recognize that these plans are going to be built to some extent in a straw house. Executive orders are why Trump is able to threaten the DACA recipients. Um, Obama's protection of them was through executive order. When executives change, the possibility always opens up for a direct attack on the legislative actions taken under the orders of the previous executive, the previous president. A scenario where Bernie Sanders wins the election, he he wins the Democratic primary and then defeats Trump, which I believe he will, uh, but is forced to extensively use executive orders to improve our circumstances, is setting us up for a significant regression if he is unable to capture a second term or more likely, progressives are unable to build a winning campaign after both of his terms are up. If you support the initiatives that we're going to cover today, make a mental note that if these initiatives pass through the executive order, they will exist in a state of flux and they're going to require a sustained movement to form them into a more concrete reality that a new president can't just come in and and rescind, you know, based on their whims. In a section titled Day One, Bernie outlines his plan to stop all deportations until an audit of past and present practices and policy are complete. He wants to stop all funding for a wall. He wants to overturn the Muslim ban and instruct the Department of Justice to stop any legal or funding restrictions to sanctuary cities. He wants to end the for-profit detention of detainees, including instead connecting them with sponsors and support. He's going to rescind Trump's quote unquote public charge rule that discriminates against immigrants on the basis of income or disability. Essentially, it allows us to screen the people coming in. So if you're poor, you can't come in. On day one, he plans to reunite children separated from families to begin that process. And then finally, work with Latin American countries to develop actionable steps to stabilize the region's migrant crisis. So. Bernie's first steps essentially seem to be stemming the bleeding, right? Reversing, rescinding, and fixing the damage that Trump has caused in America um, with his immigration policies. This comes on the heels of a recent report from the Office of the Inspector General that said, and I quote, the total number of children separated from a parent or guardian by immigration authorities is unknown. So our government has admitted in writing in a public report that they do not know how many children they took away from their parents, um, which really is incredibly disheartening if you imagine there was going to be any viable solution that didn't totally traumatize these children. An underlying theme in these initial proposals is the idea that there is a root cause to migration. It's not just people coming to America because they want to, quote, you know, steal jobs or be lazy. The common but contradictory argument put forth by so many who are anti-immigration The root causes are economic and political. People migrate for survival. Um, That's always been the history of migration. Even when your grandparents or great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents came over here, or if you're a native, um, when they crossed the uh, over through Alaska back in the day. What what this is really about is approaching migration from an empathy-first approach, a recognition of human beings who have been dealt an entirely different set of circumstances because of their birth lottery, right? It's easy to sit here in America and criticize migrants. It's much more difficult to genuinely embrace the deep and historic systemic disadvantages that they have existed within. Bernie's plan involves calling an immediate summit with leaders from Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Mexico and other countries to really address the root causes of migration. Now, root cause thinking is a common practice in the most advanced sectors of production today, those existing within the knowledge economy. It's the ability to see the forest for the trees, right? To understand that in many circumstances, there is much more behind the scenes than what we see on the surface. Our human capacity gives us the ability to imagine with intent, to envision ourselves in scenarios that we are wholly unfamiliar with. You know, I'm reminded about a quote from Marcus Aurelius in his book, Meditations. He said, everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not the truth. The truth is not going to be found from the American perspective. 
It'll be found from a collaborative, multinational effort to recognize the root cause and develop systemic solutions to stem the flow of migration at the source by directly remedying its causes. So what does that mean? Systemic situations might be economic investment, right? Social investment, educational investment. If the United States is serious about stemming the flow of immigration, it'll help invest in the countries that have people leaving those countries in droves. And why are they leaving? It's politically unstable. It's dangerous. There's absolutely no opportunity. Um, some of these countries have been, their natural resources have been ravaged uh, by Western democracies in the past. There's a lot of reasons. So this type of empathic approach, uh, you know, going forward with the idea of cooperation to develop genuine solutions is, is really what Bernie's all about in this immigration plan. Bernie also plans to extend the support and the expansion of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, otherwise known as DACA, right? And also the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents, which is DAPA. Uh, his objective is to ensure that the 85% of undocumented immigrants who have lived, worked, and contributed in America for five years or more can live their life without fear of deportation. Now that includes immediately extending legal status to the 1.8 million young people currently eligible for the DACA program and providing administration relief to their parents. Um, those with temporary protected status and parents of also legal and permanent residents would also get that, that relief. He also wants to expand it to those who came into the United States under the age of 18 and remove like these arbitrary cutoff dates. Now we talked earlier about executive authority, right? I mean, this is exactly what he'll probably have to use executive authority for. Obama used his executive authority to put the plan in place. Trump is using his executive authority to remove the plan. Uh, and Bernie will likely have to put it back into place. I mean, this is the unfortunate game when things are passed using you know, executive privilege. Um, another thing he, he wants to include in his plan is returning deported veterans, which in my humble opinion is disgusting that they were deported in the first place. Uh, he wants to bring them back to the United States. You know, I find it hard pressed for anyone to make a, a really reasonable argument that people who joined the military, served our country, fought in wars, okay, uh, you know, we, a reminder that we've had a war that's been going on for over, you know, I believe, over 18 years now. Um, they're recruiting people into the war today who weren't even born when it started. You're going to take soldiers who risk their lives for America. Um, and whether or not you agree with the war is not relevant. I'm not pro-war. I don't agree with the war that we're in. But I don't blame that or I don't put that blame on those veterans. And to deport veterans, I mean, what a disgusting reflection of American values in modern day. For those of you who you know, are, uh, if you're listening or you know someone who's a hardcore supporter of Trump's immigration plans, you should bring this up because I, I think what's important about that is that under Trump's plan, you don't get one without the other. You have to say, someone has to say, I'm okay with separating families uh, at the border. I'm okay with deporting veterans who served in the U.S. military. I'm okay with deporting people uh, who are under the DACA program who've never been to their country of origin. Um, they're here. They've always been here. But I want to you know, deport them to this, frankly, foreign country as far as they're concerned. Um, you know, you can't have the, you know, the good without the bad under, under Trump's program. It's all mess, meshed into one. The DACA and DAPA programs are protections for the children of immigrants. And today in the United States, there seem to be a reasonable and unreasonable stances about immigration for really from, from multiple perspectives. Some socialists and, and progressives may call for totally open borders. And in the long term, I'm, I'm supporting of this. Um, today, we have the free movement of capital and goods throughout the world, but not people. Why do human beings have less freedom than capital and goods? Now, with that said, in the immediate present, I don't believe that's an option. Given that we'll still operate under a singular version of the market economy so far, there would just be an influx of labor that would drive down wages, and that would be pretty devastating for our already impoverished rural communities. Now, in the future, when we build a much higher floor and people are able to express their experimental potential in the direction of their choice, Open borders would contribute to achieving explosive levels of growth and innovation. But today, it's, it's just not feasible. 
Conservatives might call DACA recipients illegal, uh, but that's an asinine claim. No, no child is illegal because of the choices of their parent. No child who has roots or relation to their parent's country of origin should be forced to be deported back to it. It's, it's a bad policy and it's just cruel. And while support for this certainly reflects parts of America, you know, the America of today, I should say, it is not the America of tomorrow. It's not the America that we are going to be. If you're ever confronted with someone who believes that the children of immigrants are to blame and don't deserve support, you know, I don't necessarily recommend engaging with them. I, I know that's kind of contradictory to the message I've put so far and I, I spread often, which is, you know, we as progressives need to lead with love, even for the rural white working class. But frankly, the mental gymnastics needed to, to genuinely believe that a child who was brought to the United States and raised here from infancy, um, to, to, to believe that they should be deported says more about the moral character of the individual than it does their, their policy acumen. To put it another way, you, know, you may just not want to waste your time. It's not a policy argument. They're not talking policy. It's a moral argument um, from their kind of twisted perspective, it, really that I believe is at the core of the argument is the the you know, fear of loss of social status and power among this white working class, um, which is, you know, I'm not denying um, the validity or, or how about this? I'm not denying that there is validity in the claim within the claim. I'm not saying the claim is valid, but there there, there are valid points of it. Um, but still, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make up for the, these kind of approaches to immigration. I've personally spoken with immigration critics who are willing to overlook the cruelty of our current process because, in their words, reform is more important. The idea being that until we reform the institutions, we should not stop parental separations and other acts like raiding warehouses, for example, to arrest over 600 people while conveniently not arresting the CEOs. Um, I want to share a little personal story. My first job out of college was with this $20 billion financial services company. And I worked on the night shift in a print center, um, and they employed a lot of undocumented immigrants. And I am telling you flat out, the CEOs knew. There wasn't a person in that building who didn't know the situation. Um, and they were incredible people. We loved them. It wasn't even an issue about that. But to not arrest the CEO is, is just frankly injustice in its purest form. How do you arrest the people who have built a community who are working for a living, um, but not arrest the person who is willingly employing them? Over 600 of them, by the way. Uh, it's, it's just unjust. Now, by the way, a Gallup poll suggests that Americans overwhelmingly support a pathway for citizenship for undocumented immigrants. Uh, and Bernie's addressing that by pushing Congress to enact a swift, fair pathway to citizenship for the 11 million unauthorized immigrants currently living, working, and contributing uh, to America today. He wants to ensure that the path to citizenship is broad, it's inclusive, and minimizes financial burdens. He wants to establish a path to legal permanent status and citizenship within five years. He also wants to ensure that old and low-level contacts with the criminal justice system, for example, like having an eighth of weed, doesn't automatically prevent undocumented immigrants from obtaining citizenship. He wants to prioritize expedited citizenship for undocumented youth, so making sure that the young undocumented people have uh, the quickest pathway to becoming citizens, and ensuring that any path to citizenship does not come with a reduction in traditional family-based visas. The plan shifts the priority of American institutions from deportation to integration. You know, one of the things I always find perplexing about politics throughout the world is the genuine lack of consciousness imbued into the process. Our history shows us time and time again that the most impactful solutions are cooperative, they are inclusive, and they involve multiple stakeholders. Oppressive policies and positions have always undermined public faith in institutions and lowered trust within societies. We need to look no further than the current Hong Kong situation, a sad and somber reminder that the reality of freedom of expression exists within today. Bernie's plan is an integrative approach that will achieve immigration reform sought after by so many. 
you know, really central to Bernie's plan is a statement found within the plan, which is, uh, and I quote, no human being is illegal. That's why a major part of the plan he presents is centered around decriminalizing immigration and demilitarizing our border. He's going to accomplish this by repealing 8 U.S. Code Section 1325, putting border crossings on par with other forms of immigration violations, for example, like overstaying a visa. He's going to end the priority enforcement program, the PEP, the 287G program, the Secure Communities and Criminal Alien program, and other programs that essentially turn local law enforcement into immigration officers. He's going to repeal the 1996 immigration laws, which means that he's going to be repealing the three and 10 year bans, ending permanent deportation, expedited removal, and ending mandatory detention. He's going to restore essentially a case by case discretion for uh, immigration judges. So it's not a blanket policy. It's a, you know, consider the, the situation at hand. He's going to restore the definition of a quote, aggravated felony to its initial intent, which is violent crimes and serious drug trafficking. And he's going to end the, quote, constitution-free zone within 100 miles of the border. Uh, he wants to also end detention for families, children, and immigrants without violent crime convictions, and instead authorize and fund community-based alternatives to detention, such as, for example, connecting immigrants with health, legal, educational, and work resources. Part of this process would break up ICE and the CBP and redistribute their functions to the proper authorities. So for example, deportation, enforcement, uh, border, and investigatory authority would return to the Department of Justice. Customs authority would return to the Treasury Department, and naturalization and citizenship authority would be given to the State Department. And the list really continues. Um, we've gone over a lot so far, and I'm going to link the full plan below. Um, it includes, in addition to what we've talked about, uh, strengthening worker protections for immigrant workers, the same workers who make up the vast majority of those employed in the United States agricultural sector. Um, so there's really a lot more including the plan that we really just for time purposes aren't going to cover today. Um, but again, it is linked below. Overall, Bernie's plan should sway, I, I think, the traditional conservative voter. Although the plans are progressive in their solutions, they're not regressive, they are progressive, they are about progress, um, it is the fact that he is providing a very real and tangible solutions that can unite us around immigration. It's, it's real reform. No other political actor has gone as deep as Sanders when it comes to immigration reform. And you've probably heard the phrase before that the definition of insanity right, is doing the same things over and over again, but expecting different results. Bernie's immigration plan is a break from the routine insanity of hand, how we handle immigration in this country. It's a huge step in the right direction to finally fix our broken system and free Americans from the cruel practices being pursued in our names today. I'll wrap up Bernie's plan with this. You know, if you find yourself entrenched in discussion with someone who is strongly anti-immigration, I would begin the conversation by asking them, what they believe is a viable solution to the problem. One of the things I always find challenging with criticism, um, because uh, you know, anytime you put stuff out there, you're going to be criticized, is when people criticize without offering alternatives, alternative solutions. So I think it's important that if people are gonna be critical, we call them out on what is your alternative. Now we dismiss ideas right away, like for example, deport them all. It's, that is a totally unrealistic solution, both in terms of logistics and the popular will. Um, but we do wanna talk about you know, how we want to understand their perspective. Um, but also, you know, we expect them to provide alternatives to support their staunch positions. In the end, I, I imagine that many of the things that they may dream of will be found here in the Sanders plan. And that's a great opportunity to show someone that policies are not binary. We should focus on the issues and not on the teams, right? It's not about Democrat or Republican. It's about the policy. If what you want is being proposed by a progressive, you should vote for progressive. I mean, that's the, that's the idea, right? It's basic logic that caters to their personal interests and satisfies their need of having their personal opinion heard and acted upon. Yeah, it's not the easy route, right? But this is the world we live in today. So moving on to a lighter note, possibly not a lighter note, uh, is our technology news for the day. Recently, Elon Musk talked about Neuralink and bringing AI superintelligence to the brain. Uh, and the, essentially, his Neuralink firm is right now in the process of researching how to integrate computers into the brain 
to deal with uh, medical issues. So for example, you might say someone who has mobility issues, essentially they would put a chip, they call it the N1 chip, and it's a hermetically sealed chip. It's about four millimeters by four millimeters, so it's, it's very small. And it sits in like this cylindrical package, uh, essentially that's eight millimeters in diameter. Uh, each chip is uh, about, has about 1,024 electrodes, which is about 100 times more uh, than the current systems that are used to treat Parkinson's. So this is, you know, by the way, implanting chips into our bodies is something that's already being done. This isn't um, radical. Uh, this exists. What Musk talks about and what I, I'm really fascinated about is essentially that he wants to use Neuralink beyond just medicine, but for the, the aspect of super intelligence. And the idea behind this is that right now the brain is divided into two systems, right? You have the limbic system that drives impulses and the cortex system, which is, you know, tries to control the limbic system while also acting as like an intelligence layer. Um, the, the super intelligence he's talked about, these, these installing these chips, they don't replace any of the layers. You're not like saying, oh, I'm going to take my brain and, and add an additional layer to it. He's essentially talking about like a new neocortex. Um, if you, so if you, uh, if you have ever researched anything about the brain, the brain is divided into those two systems that we talked about, those two halves, but there's also a, a layer called the neocortex. The neocortex is a layer kind of around our brain. It's uniquely human. Um, and what the neocortex does is it provides us the ability to kind of imagine. It provides us speech, language, music. It provides us um, with reasoning capabilities um, that are unique to the human species. What Musk is suggesting is that we could add an additional layer to the brain. Uh, you would see, he calls it a, essentially a tertiary layer where digital superintelligence lies. You could imagine that it'll be way, way more intelligent than the cortex that we already have, but also exists peacefully and kind of in a benign manner with the cortex and limbic systems of our brain. So essentially this chip, you know, let's put it in like you know, very basic terms. You could imagine having a chip in your brain that would allow you to instantly look up any information you wanted. So imagine, and I'll, I'll use a DuckDuckGo. We don't want to have this associated with Google, that's for sure. But let's say DuckDuckGo or some other search engine that is private, anonymous, and doesn't record your uh, searches. So when you want to look up information, you can, you know, at a snap of your fingers, have that information in your head. Um, and I think this, this kind of news, I find very fascinating, but I know some people find very intimidating. Um, the, the idea of superhumans and superhuman intelligence brings up a whole suite of uh, moral and ethical issues that we kind of have to deal with uh, in this process. And I think the challenge when you talk about superintelligence and chips is that you create a scenario where there's really the, the people who are forced to be chipped in order to be competitive. And I, and I think that is almost definitely what I imagine will happen. That's it's my prediction. You heard it here first is that this will go get rolled out and there'll be controversy and people will be allowed to do it. And there may be political pushback. For example, some of the religious sects may push back against it. I think there is um, something about the mark of the devil and some of these religious texts where you're not supposed to you know, mesh the body with metal. Um, of course, these were written in the age of antiquity. So, you know, I'm not sure that necessarily applies to microprocessors. Uh, but either way, you, you, you'll have people who will adopt it quickly. And, and I'll go on the record and saying, uh, I am very excited about this technology. It is something that I would absolutely uh, participate in as soon as I could afford it, which I imagine the technology won't be too expensive by the time it gets released. Maybe the initial versions will, uh, but it'll you know, rapidly decline like all technologies. I mean, if I could recall every book that I've read verbatim, if I could search through chapters, uh, search my notes, the potential this holds for just creativity, self-expression, productivity uh, is, is, I don't think I'm exaggerating when, I'm, when I say this, it's something that is frankly incomprehensible to us today. Um, we can't genuinely give uh, the imagination of it real form and understanding. It's, it's so far from our understanding of what is today, um, but it, it could really create an entirely new world. And I think that's, that's really huge. Now, I want, to, I want to be clear that this is a, a long ways away, and, and not everyone is so keen on this idea. For example, um, Noel Sharkey, of the, he's a professor of robotics at the University of Sheffield, um, told The Telegraph in an interview that the idea was nonsense, that the Neuralink was nonsense. 
One funny thing, and um, he had a, a he was on a podcast. Elon Musk was uh, in April 2019, um, and he was asked a question. He he was essentially saying like, if when AI comes to fruition, when when the first genuine artificial intelligence is is given a chance, what would you ask? And Musk said, "What is outside the simulation?" <laughs> So, you know, I just, this is technology that we should know about. And, and let's, let's spin it to a progressive angle and we can kind of wrap up on this for this week. This type of enhancement, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be about the have and the have nots. Now you can opt out of getting this, right? Certainly no one's going to force anyone to put a chip in their brain. However, um, those without it are going to be at a significant disadvantage. Um, and uh, over time, uh, as is historically true, new generations will adopt it. We've seen this time and time again, uh, people who are unfamiliar with technology or, or less quick to adapt it, um, but there's no shortage of people who will, and people who are born into a world where this is the norm uh, will certainly adopt it. Now, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, right? I think it, it's certainly got some ethical consequences um, that we should consider, some philosophical consequences we should consider. What will this mean for our humanity? What will super intelligence mean? I mean, it, it will enhance things for certain, um, will it make it boring? I don't think so, but is it possible? Could it change our interactions with one another? Probably, right? Almost definitely. How will it affect our self-worth? I mean, these are really deep, introspective questions. And as progressives, we, we kind of have to think about how are we going to legislate this? How do we ensure that this doesn't end up as a tool solely for the uber wealthy and rich to further concentrate their dominance? How do we make sure that anyone who wants this type of technology um, has access to it, right? This is the kind of technology, super intelligence, that could radically reshape uh, what it means to be human, if we even are human after the fact. I don't know that we would really be considered human in the traditional biological sense. Um, that's okay, right? Consciousness evolves. It's always evolved. Uh, it's been evolving really since the expansion of the Big Bang, depending on how you see it. Um, but you know, life uh, emerged, right? Life was an emergent property on Earth and, and consciousness has evolved in a lot of different forms since then. Um, this is just a consciousness kind of taking a, a proactive step in evolving again. So uh, you know, let me know what you think in the comments below. Would you take the chip? If the chip was available today, if you could have super intelligence, access the internet from your brain, think of anything you wanted, store uh, information in a, you know, let's say a secure encrypted cloud, and of course, you know, we're just dreaming, but what would that be like? Would you accept it? Would you, be a, would you be an early adopter? Would you be a resistor? These are the kind of questions that progressives need to ask themselves now because you know, so much of the political machine, so much of the existing political regimes are so caught up in the minutia of just the bullshit that goes along with being a politician and their careers over doing genuine good. But if we don't begin to have these discussions as a collective population, um, when we're, we're almost certainly setting ourselves up for calamity when and if that technology manifests. Because if we haven't had the ethical conversations, the philosophical conversations, if we haven't discussed it among ourselves, how we want to regulate it, if we want to regulate it, right? I mean, these are, these are democratic decisions to be made. Um, but, you know, it's, it's almost certainly under the current regime of power and thought going to be left by the wayside. So uh, if you consider yourself a progressive, have this conversation with people. Talk about Neuralink. Talk about what would you do if this was the case? How would this benefit your life? How would it be negative, right? Let's get the imagination running uh, because this is, you know, I, I think if we're proactive about this, it, it could be tremendous. The opposite, of course, is if we're reactive, as we are with, with many things, um, it could be uh, very challenging for a lot of people. So on that note, my fellow progressives, I want to wrap it up. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning into the weekly progress report here at the Thinking Progressive Podcast. Again, my name is Ron Rivers. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.